This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's show deals with the issue of religious institutions discriminating against the LGBTQ plus community. Our guest was a senior director at the Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California, until she was fired for refusing to sign the school's mandatory statement of faith, which prohibits affirmation of same-sex marriage. When she first entered Fuller as a student in 2016, she did sign the statement of faith, and she signed it again in 2022, this time as an employee, pursuant to Fuller's policy of requiring senior staff members to sign the statement annually. I should point out that there are court rulings throughout the United States permitting discrimination by religious institutions against gay students and employees, and this was most recently seen in October 2020 when the court affirmed the Fuller Seminary's right to expel two students for being in same-sex marriages. Getting back to our guest, when she was required in 2023 to re-sign the statement she realized that it would be wrong for her to do that, given her imminent ordination into the United Church of Christ, which does accept marriage for same-sex couples. And she also came to the realization that it was ethically wrong and hypocritical for the Fuller Theological Seminary, which prides itself in being multi-denominational, to make money from denominations that affirm same-sex marriage, but at the same time compel its students and employees to sign a homophobic statement of faith and to dismiss those who refuse to do so. As a result of our guest being fired and the groundswell of support she received not only from students and faculty at Fuller, but from the community at large and the media, the Board of Trustees at the Fuller Theological Seminary created a task force to reconsider its policies relating to human sexuality. And the school has now proposed new sexuality standards for the students, but not for staff and faculty. So there is still much work to be done. I'm pleased to welcome Pastor Ruth Schmidt to our show. Pastor Ruth, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Let's start with the obvious question. You signed the statement of faith twice, once in 2016 when you first became a student, and then again as an employee in 2022. Let's start with 2016. Why did you sign at that time? Going into seminary, I had a lot of questions that I wanted answers to. And one of those was, what does the Bible have to say? What does the church have to say about gay marriage? And so I didn't know yet. I didn't have a conviction about that. I was raised very conservatively. I've been in ministry for 25 years. And the context I was coming from did not affirm gay relationships. But I had a hunch that there was more to the story. <laughs> and so I went to seminary to try to figure that out. So I signed it at the beginning because I was in a season of discernment as a student. And I was there to learn. And I signed it because that's where I was at spiritually. Um, that, was an honest, that was an honest expression of where I was at. Now, at some point, you became an employee at the Fuller Seminary. What was your job there? I actually held a couple different jobs. I was part-time all throughout, I think, 2018 and 2019. And then I became full-time employee as a director of strategy was my first role in 2020. July of 2020, I started full-time. I had not completed my MDiv yet, so I was working full-time, working on my master's. But before that, I had worked for their film initiative, and then I'd also worked, they had a hotel on campus for a time, and I worked as a staffer there. Now let's move to 2022. You were a senior staff member at Fuller. Why did you sign the Statement of Faith at that time? So I actually, in 2020, I was not hired as at the senior level. I was hired as just a strategy person. And then I, after that, I did, I think I had two or three promotions within the span of three years. And so it wasn't until I got that title of senior director that I entered into that senior level that required the statement be signed every year. I was not told that that was going to be required. So that second requiring of my signature came to, as a huge surprise to me. <laughs> so I signed that because it came in my inbox three weeks before it was due and it was the middle of a pandemic and I had no other way to pay rent. I wrestled with it because my at that time, my convictions had changed. I myself had come out as queer 
I knew that I wanted to be ordained into a denomination that married gay folks. And so that was a huge conflict of my in, in like integrity internally and also my theology. But God gave me peace. And I was like, OK, three weeks to lose a job is just not it's not tenable. And so I made a vow to myself at that time. I will never sign this again. So now let's move to 2023. What changed within your belief systems or your life circumstances that compelled you to refuse to re-sign the statement? I think it's twofold. One, I want to give credit to the seminary. They helped me on that journey of becoming theologically affirming of gay marriage. I took a course at Fuller called Human Sexuality and Ethics. And in that class, we covered theologians who are affirming and supportive of gay relationships and gay marriage. And that's because Fuller wanted to offer a robust syllabus. They wanted to show all theological sides. I personally, with my discernment with the Holy Spirit, ended up more on the affirming side than some of the folks in that class. So that was the first stone. That was the theological stepping stone. The second was when I picked a place to be ordained, I wanted to pick a place that gay, that married and honored gay clergy and gay folks. And so looking at my upcoming ordination vows and, you know, looking at my own personal beliefs and lo also looking at my community, my fellow queer siblings, I could not sign something that was going to degrade them or cast a more marginalizing light on them within the church. I understand you didn't just refuse to sign the statement. You offered to write an explanation saying why you couldn't sign the statement, but that proposal was rejected, correct? That's right. Yeah, I proposed a legal writer that would have been a formally, a formal attachment to that document. And I took that all the way up the chain of command. All of my superiors were behind me. I felt supported. They all read it. And then it got escalated up to the legal counsel at Fuller, as well as a director of HR. And that's when they said no. <laughs> and the reason they gave me was that if they if they let me sign that, they'd have to let everyone sign it. Well, why would that be a problem? I know. <laughs> that's when they told me no, I was like, well, that's kind of the point, is that those of us who want to live in communion with a more conservative group of Christians, I wasn't asking them to change. And I actually wanted to continue to work there. I think we see right now a, a massive rift in Christianity. We've got a really extreme polarized side and we need more places where people can come together and say, we disagree on a lot, but we do follow in the path of Christ. And so what does that look like for us to model that together? When you refused to sign the statement, did any of your colleagues at Fuller stand with you and also refuse to sign the statement? No, and I think that's partly because the signature signing window had closed once it became public that I had refused to sign it. I was very discreet and respectful in my communications throughout that whole deliberation process. I respected HR's process and I didn't talk about it publicly until I was terminated on January 2nd. I understand you were fired in a Zoom call. What did they say to you? Well, I do want to give credit to the director of HR. She handled it very gracefully. My boss handled it very gracefully. And I work remote. Uh, my boss is in another state. And so it was very normal for the meeting to be on Zoom. I wasn't offended by that. But they just clearly laid out the board of trustees and the legal counsel at Fuller are not going to find a way forward with this writer. And so it's the end. It's the end of the professional relationship. It was hard. <laughs> Well, yes, clearly you were upset at being fired. And that raises the obvious question, Pastor Ruth, why would you want to work for an organization that was homophobic? Yeah, this question I've gotten a lot. And I think it's probably the most important message that I want to help get out. I would say one majorly beautiful aspect about the school is that it does provide a place for more conservative and more progressive Christians to come together and work. If my religious freedom could be respected, and if I could be openly queer, which I was, then I wanted to stay because I wanted to help keep that communication open. I had PhD students come to me after I was fired and they would say, I am not personally affirming. I'm not there yet in my theology. I don't know if I'll ever get there, but I don't appreciate what happened to you. And I want you in my education space because I want to learn from you. And so it's that openness and that charity of theology, of conversation, that I think is the backbone of a healthy religious space. So 
I was going to stand up for my queer siblings. I wasn't going to back down, but I also wanted to foster a conversation. Well, I want to ask you about the public reaction to your being fired. Let's start first with the reaction within the Fuller Seminary. How did the people there react? I had many colleagues who were very shocked. I sent an open letter to the president and just clearly laid out that this is a dangerous precedent. This is not a healthy step for the school in the long run. And there will be consequences to this because a majority of staff are either neutral or affirming of working with gay faculty, staff members, students. So I got an outpouring of support. All my social channels, my inbox, were flooded with people saying, I cannot believe this happened. And also how can I help you and how can we turn it around? Yeah. Do you think the senior management at Fuller was aware that you had this groundswell of support from within? They did not anticipate it. One of the, this is a weakness in higher ed, no matter where you're studying, but the board of trustees or the board that controls a school is oftentimes very, oftentimes very separated from the, the campus life. And so I don't think they had any foresight into the culture and how we were going to respond and how how much it would hurt. It, I think it hurt a lot of staff members. Well, what do you think the reaction was within the evangelical community at large? <laughs> yeah, the, one of the news outlets that covered my termination was a Baptist news outlet. And, and I don't know, your viewers might not know, but they tend to be a little bit more conservative. And there were some definitely nasty comments on those blog posts. <laughs> I, I don't think that all evangelical outlets, organizations, churches see the value in working collaboratively with people that they disagree with. And I respect that. That is their religious freedom. I do think they're missing an opportunity to model what the kingdom of heaven looks like, which is we're all in this together. There's no separation in heaven. <laughs> so yeah, that I give them grace. They're on their journey and they they stand before God and they're believing what they feel convicted to and or their convictions are. So I don't judge them, um, but it is disappointing. Very. You've said yeah. publicly that it's morally and ethically wrong for Fuller to have a homophobic policy, but still be making money from denominations that affirm gay marriage. In what way is Fuller making money from those denominations? The... PCUSA, which is a Presbyterian organization, and then also the ELCA, which is uh, Lutheran. Both of those have formal partnerships with Fuller Seminary and some of the school's initiatives towards education and continuing ed. And so for both of those denominations who put gay clergy in the pulpit and who marry gay folks in the churches, <laughs> if you're gonna work with them, you have got to honor the fact that you also have gay clergy in your staff and you can't get money from these organizations if you're gonna fire your queer staff for standing up for their rights. So I don't think that had ever been evaluated. I don't think that had ever even been realized or looked at as a problem. And so I also contacted the denominations and I said, this is happening. This is not ethical, let alone <laughs> immoral, <laughs> you know? and. I think they took it very, very seriously. And so I'm not privy to any of the conversations that might've happened with the administration and those denominations after I left, but I like to think that some very serious conversations happened at a high level. Well, as you know, Fuller launched a task force to re-examine their approach to human sexuality. I'm going to assume here that you were not invited to be part of that task force? That's correct. Yes, it was just for current student, staff and faculty. And so and, and that and that makes sense. I think, you know, my my role with the school shifted a little after I was terminated. And so um, that invitation was not extended to me. But I know the folks that are a part of it. And, and I trust that community. There's there's good people in that school. I understand that Fuller has recently decided to change its policy so that students in gay relationships will no longer be expelled. Is that right? Yeah, that's a big deal. And it's almost such a big deal. I haven't fully realized it because it's pretty new. It happened about a week ago. The board will vote on that in May to make it official. But the way that it was presented internally at the school, the language that was used makes me think it is a very serious step and that I, I highly doubt it'll be voted down in May. But they have not changed their standards for staff and faculty, correct? Yeah, 
That's right. And, and their reasoning for that makes sense to me, even though I don't agree with it. And I'm going to work to the capacity that I can to change it. I think what they're concerned about is the funders and the way the money is coming into the school. They're afraid of losing more conservative funders. And if the people who are representing the school are openly gay or are promoting gay theology, queer theology, I think they're concerned that they'll lose that money. And um, this is a reality that's facing every higher ed institution. It's money is the bottom line. But for a Christian school that claims that theology is what anchors us and not money, this is another discrepancy of ethics. And so I hope they continue to review it. Well, so do I, because you, you've you expressed it perfectly. I mean, I think it's important to stress that there's a difference between Fuller actually changing its policies to support same-sex marriage versus simply changing its policies to not expel people who support gay marriage. In other words, becoming more tolerant of people who disagree with their sexuality policies. Do you have any confidence that eventually Fuller will change its policies to actually support same-sex marriage? That's such a good question. I actually haven't even dreamed that far. (laughs) I think, you know, in activism, there's, you know, the concept of minimizing risk, uh, minimizing damage. And so in, in my view of the work that's being done, we're still in the, how do we minimize damage mode? I would love for Fuller to shift directions and for harm to no longer be on the, you know, on the table and for it to be more about celebrating and and really supporting the path that the students feel called to. This, this is a place where future pastors are being molded. And if a pastor says that God is leading them to believe something within a denomination that is well-established, like PCUSA, the Presbyterians, the school should get behind that student and celebrate that and not, you know, kind of stand on the sidelines and be like, we don't approve, but we're not going to expel you, you know? <laughs> Well, given everything you've been through, Pastor Ruth, what do you think of the Fuller Theological Seminary today? I mean, would you send students there? It would depend on the student. I think part part of my training to become a pastor was going through chaplaincy at a hospital. And when you go through chaplaincy, you learn to listen to what the needs of that person, what they're expressing. And so if I was sitting down with a future student, I would listen to them and I'd see what is the next right step for them. If that student is queer, I would not suggest they go to Fuller. (laughs) If that student is in the middle of a deconstruction process and is questioning everything about evangelical culture, Fuller might be a beautiful next step. It is a very comfortable and safe place to take a step outside of what you were raised in. That's what it was for me. So it would depend on the kid. (laughs) Tell me about your own career plans. Where do you see yourself making the biggest contribution within the church community? I am currently the interim associate pastor of Claremont Presbyterian in California. I've been on staff full-time for two weeks now, so I am employed and I'm really happy. (laughs) And I am excited about what they're doing there. They're multi-generational. It's it's really exciting. Long-term, what I see, Christianity is in a 500-year shift. And we're at that 500-year mark. And we've seen in history, Christianity changes in massive ways every 500 years. Right now, Churches are dying. Eight churches close permanently in the United States every single day. And so there's a massive, massive opportunity for those of us who are younger clergy, and by younger, I mean in our 40s, (laughs) to be a part of that next iteration. What will it look like in this shift? So I'm energized. I'm excited. I think it's going to, we need to be creative. I think a lot of the old structures are going to have to fall away. Um, But the core message of peace, of justice, compassion, that will guide us and we're, we're gonna be all right. Do you have thoughts about how the church can remain relevant to most people's lives? I think it's gonna take a lot of humility on the side of the church and a lot of listening on the side of the church. And by church, I mean big C church, all the denominations together. We have to recognize that people aren't showing up to church because they're not comfortable and they don't wanna be there. And then we need to be brave and ask why. Are there structures in place that the time has come for those to end? And then we need to dream. What does an evening church look like? What does a once a month church look like? What does a garden church look like? There's all these different expressions of of Christians gathering. Um, And there are groups of people doing it. Every denomination has their little pocket of like the innovators. But we need to get everybody in that innovation mode. So. 
Well, Pastor Ruth, I want to commend you for your courage and your integrity in standing for what you believe is right and supporting equality, even if it meant losing your job. I think you exemplify the very best in what we want to see in our clergy. And I thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. Oh, that's such an honor. Thank you for saying it. And thank you for having me on. (laughs) Our guest has been Pastor Ruth Schmidt. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Robert Monaghan, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.